Now, many of you will have read or at least bought Thomas Piketty's book, Capital. Piketty's an economist who has crunched numbers about inequality. And he has shown that in 21st century America, the gap between the wealthiest sliver at the top and the bottom 20 to 40% is larger than it has ever been in American history. And he uses two big measures. One is wealth, how much you own, and that's cumulative because each year you accumulate wealth. The wealth gap is absolutely extraordinary at this point. A few hundred families at the top of the American economy have the equivalent in wealth ownership of the bottom 150 million Americans. And the second part of the equation is earnings. In a given year, what are you going to earn? And by that measure, he has shown that the earnings inequality between the top and the bottom is bigger than it's been in a century. And it's projected to get bigger and bigger and bigger over the next two to three decades. Now, one of the consequences of this is that at the bottom of the economy, there are vast wells of poverty accumulating. Numbers went down a little bit in the last few months, but there are still 45 million Americans who fall underneath the government-defined poverty line. 15 million of those Americans are children. 15 million children in the wealthiest country in the world live in poverty. There's no other first world country with child poverty rates that bad and that destructive. And what makes that even worse is that's just an average. And different demographics have different poverty rates. If you go to New Orleans or you go to Detroit, two out of three African-American children live in poverty. Two out of three African-American kids in some of the biggest cities in this country live below the poverty line. Even after the Affordable Care Act kicked in, 41 million Americans still do not have good, secure access to health care. And again, many millions of those Americans without access to health care are children. Now, when you think about this, something extraordinary has happened. A country that prides itself on upward mobility, a country that has made upward mobility a part of its foundational understanding of what it is and what it means and what it represents, a country that has had the Horatio Alger myth for decades, this notion that you can pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, has somehow ended up with less social mobility and deeper levels of poverty and especially deeper levels of child poverty than any other first world democracy. Has more child poverty than Canada, more child poverty than England, than France, than Japan. It has more child poverty than economic basket cases like Greece and like Spain. And that's an important point to make. Even countries that are struggling economically in the most profound of ways have found a way to keep more of their children out of poverty than this 21st century America. Now, some of this is to do with 2008, but a lot of it goes back way before 2008. I was going around the country 10, 15 years ago, and I was talking to people who had two, three jobs, but they were minimum wage jobs, and they still ran out of money, and they still ran out of food. I went to Longview, Washington, an aluminum town, and a company had come in, had stripped the company of all the profitable parts, and then declared bankruptcy. And in declaring bankruptcy, it had taken away the pensions of thousands and thousands of workers who had retired in their 50s, been promised a union pension, and now had nothing. I interviewed a woman called Abrisha Edick in upstate New York. She was a Walmart worker. Walmart is one of the biggest companies in the world. And she was in her 60s, she was in terrible health, she was being paid just above minimum wage, and she was eating TV dinners because she couldn't afford anything more nutritious on her salary. I went to a pantry in Siskiyou County in upstate California and I interviewed this old couple who ran the pantry and I said, why do you run this? Why don't you just sit back and relax? And they said, well, we run this because many of our neighbors have jobs, but the month is longer than the paycheck. And I said, well, you know, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, two, three weeks into the month, they always run out of money. And when they run out of money, their fridges get empty. And these are families and they don't have enough food to feed their children. And that's why we run this food pantry.
Now again, that was all during the good times. That was pre-2007. That was when the economy was growing. That was when unemployment was low. That was when the stock market was booming and housing prices were going up. After 2008, all of those trends get magnified because millions of people lose their savings. Millions of people lose their jobs. Millions of people lose their houses. And millions of people, when they get re-employed at the back end of the recession, find that they're now earning less. And they're in jobs with less security than the jobs they lost in 2007 and 2008. When I started working on my book, I went to Harvard and I talked with someone I know there called Marshall Gantz. And Marshall's a community organizer. He came out of the um, farmers movement in the 60s in California. He worked with Cesar Chavez. And he spent his lifetime thinking about equality and equity and social fairness and justice. And he now teaches at the Kennedy School of Government. And I said to him, Marshall, I'm writing a book about poverty. Help me out here, what should I think about? And he said, well, look, the first thing to think about is you're not writing a book about poverty. And I sort of did a double take because I just told him I was. <laughs> and he said, the way you gotta think about it is poverty is the miner's canary. Well, we have sophisticated gas monitoring equipment these days, so we don't use canaries in mines. But if you went back to the 19th century, miners always took canary birds with them down into the mines. And the reason they did this was twofold. Canaries talk a lot. They're always chirping away. And they're also peculiarly sensitive to gas. So if you're a miner and you're down in the mine and the birds are chirping away and suddenly the silence, and you look over and that bird has keeled over and it's dead. It's an early warning sign that your environment has been compromised and that something toxic is undermining your environment. And that even though you don't feel it now, in a few minutes you will, and you've got to get out of that mine as quickly as you can. And Gantz said to me, that's what poverty is in 21st century America. It's a warning sign that something in the environment has gone fundamentally wrong. That we're tolerating levels of inequality that are gonna undermine the democratic structures and the political processes of the country. That we're tolerating levels of economic insecurity at the bottom of the economy that are corroding our common sense of purpose. And that we're creating an oligarchy rather than a democracy. We talk a lot about Russian oligarchs and Ukrainian oligarchs. When you look at the way the American economy is functioning and has functioned for the last couple decades, in many ways, it's coming to mirror oligarchy more than it is that of other first world democracies. And we're seeing it in an array of consequences. Brian Stevenson earlier today talked about the fact that we are now the single largest incarcerator in the world. We have 2.3 million people behind bars and overwhelmingly they are poor. And overwhelmingly those men and women come from poor neighborhoods and overwhelmingly they have not had educational opportunities and job opportunities. We have a frayed social welfare system, but we have an overactive carceral welfare system. We use our prisons as an intervention against poverty. We see it in the fact that we have a mental health care crisis, that we have a drug addiction crisis. And that the poorer you are, the harder it is to access good mental health treatment and good drug treatment. We see it in the fact that poverty exists in concentrated wells, not just in inner cities, but also in rural communities, not just in red states, but also in blue states. Poverty is becoming one of the single most common denominators in the American story. One in six Americans lives in poverty. One in six Americans nearly needs food stamps to avoid hunger. One in four children live in poverty. Six million Americans live without any access to cash. No jobs, no bank accounts, no cash welfare assistance. Six million Americans in the richest country in the world have literally no access to cash. Now the thing is, if this was some kind of natural disaster or God-given catastrophe, we could call it a tragedy. We could sort of shake our head at it, like we shake our head at earthquakes or tsunamis, and say that's awful, but there's nothing we could have done to prevent it. 
this isn't a tragedy. This isn't caused by crop failures. This isn't caused by civilizational collapse. America's poverty levels are a scandal. They're the product of policy choices and policy neglect. They're the consequence of decades in which the people at the bottom of the economy have been largely ignored, and when they haven't been ignored, they've been largely demonized. I went to Richmond, Virginia a few weeks ago reporting an article. And Richmond is a town surrounded by affluent suburbs. But in the city of Richmond itself, 27% of the population lives in poverty. And 40% of the children, four out of 10 kids, lives in poverty. If you look at what happened in Ferguson, Missouri this summer, when an unarmed teenager was shot dead and killed, shot dead, and you looked at the reaction, that is a reaction not just against injustice of violence, of police violence, but that's a reaction against the injustice of social inequity, of the fact that people feel economically disenfranchised and politically marginalized. Now, this is unsustainable. No democracy can survive if 20 to 40% of its population is that marginalized, is left that much outside the economic mainstream, and is given that little hope of upward mobility and of aspirations and dreams being realized. Now, if I left you with that, you'd boo me off the stage for being a depressing end to a very good day. And I don't want you to do that. So I want to try and make this a little bit more optimistic. And I think there's a way to do so. For the very reason that this is a scandal, not a tragedy. If I was talking about earthquakes, I wouldn't really be able to say, well, with a bit of political effort, we could stop the next big trembler in California. But if you're talking about something that is the creation of policy choices, then almost definitionally, you're talking about something that's amenable to policy solutions and amenable to community solutions and interventions. If you look at what's being done in Eastlake, in Atlanta, you have a community that was mired in poverty, where unemployment was the norm, changing into a community where employment is the norm. You had a community where bad schools were considered the norm, and now you have a community where some of the best schools in the city exist. You had a community where there was absolutely concentrated poverty, and now you have a dilution of that concentrated poverty, and you have creative thinking about how to better develop neighborhoods and how to better change the economy so that it benefits not just some, but all within a community. If you go to New York, Mayor Blasio, Mayor Bill de Blasio, put in place a pre-kindergarten universal child education guarantee, and it is being implemented. If you go to Seattle in Washington, the entire city council and the mayor ended up coming on board and supporting a $15 an hour minimum wage, a citywide minimum wage, so that workers working full time wouldn't still be earning less than the federal poverty line. San Diego, Los Angeles, a host of other cities around the country are now on the verge of adopting a genuine living wage. If you look at President Obama's Promise Zones initiative, five cities were chosen earlier this year, several more cities are going to be chosen in the next year, where federal money is going to flow into neighborhoods, targeting housing interventions, education interventions, a creative, holistic, across-the-board approach aimed at reducing scandalously high levels of poverty. For the first time in years, it is now fashionable to talk about, hopefully to care about, the issues of poverty. And there are a whole bunch of things that can be done. In my book, I talk about education reforms that can make accessible higher education to far more people. Talk about tax credit reforms that could be used to build up poverty funds so that people in poverty would have access to things like job training and to quality education maybe to things like gas stamps when gas prices spike, which is one of the triggers for poverty, especially in rural America. Alaska has an oil profit tax that's used as a dividend 
to pay all Alaska residents a certain amount of money per year ranges usually from about $1,000 to $3,000 a year. There's no reason on earth if Alaska can't do it, we couldn't do that nationally. We could have oil profit taxes, we could have other taxes on very high profit industries, and we could use that money for targeted investments in poor neighborhoods and targeted interventions designed to help poor individuals and families. Doing nothing against poverty is not an option. It's not an option pragmatically because of all the consequences it has for a broader society. And it's not an option morally because there is no good reason on earth that a country as affluent as America should have levels of poverty as high as we see in 21st century America. A hundred years ago, reformers got up in arms about child labor and they worked to push child labor laws. Trade unions got up in arms about the fact that workers were being asked to work 16 hour days, six days, even seven days a week. And they organized and put in place workplace safety rules, minimum wage laws, maximum working hour laws, workplace safety laws. In the 1960s, Michael Harrington identified the moral scandal of poverty and missed affluence. And he pushed the political culture to intervene against poverty effectively. And despite what we've been told in the last 20 or 30 years, those interventions by and large were successful. They reduced poverty, they bettered communities, and they bettered our society as a whole. There is simply no excuse in the year 2014 for a country as wealthy as America to have 20% plus of its children living in poverty. There's no moral reason for us to accept as normal and inevitable 7% unemployment and 15% joblessness rates. And there's certainly no reason for us to accept as normal and inevitable the fact that we have 2.3 million people incarcerated, the fact that our incarceration system is the largest on earth and the costliest on earth, that it is an incarceration system that in some ways resembles those of the authoritarian regimes of the mid 20th century rather than the democracies of the 21st century. None of this is inevitable. None of this is normal and none of this is acceptable. And so I'm gonna conclude by urging everybody here, keep up the work that you're doing and keep focusing on this issue because we know that with effort and with energy and with a moral commitment, a country as dynamic as America is perfectly capable of making poverty the grievous exception rather than the commonplace norm. And we're shortchanging ourselves if we don't aim towards that goal. So thank you for having me. I hope I haven't talked for too long. And thank you again.